Good morning, everyone. In an effort to keep everything on schedule, it's 9 o'clock. We're going to begin the Teaching and Learning with Technology Symposium. My name is Rob Fain. I am an uh, instructional designer at the Rochester Institute of Technology. The symposium is organized by the Finger Lakes Faculty Development Network. Instructional designers, academic technologists, and such from Syracuse to Buffalo helping each other. I'd like to begin this morning with Eric Mahan Haud of Cornell University. Eric? Before you begin, feedback forms are on your chairs. Please fill out a form for each presenter and leave it in the drop box at the, uh, the back of the room. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to be introducing you to some concepts of ePortfolios and reflection today. And what I'm going to be giving you is an overview of some concepts and approaches and additional tools that you can use. So I'm not going to be getting into detail into any of them, but I know that the presenter who's following may have some specifics to say about wikis and ePortfolios. So, just to give you a little background on myself, uh, I work with Cornell University as an instructional technologist and a, and a pro, uh, project manager. Uh, I also have been teaching uh, for the SUNY system for many years. I teach at Ithaca College as well, um, usually in the fields of English, academic writing, uh, business, business communications. Uh, I also um, worked with the SUNY Learning Network in addition, so I do a lot of online learning in addition to in-class teaching. Now I put the hat on, because what I want to give you guys the idea of here, because I'm calling this presentation The Great Reflection Medicine Show, and the tonic that I'm gonna to try to sell you today is I'm gonna to try to sell you the tonic of reflection so that you can bring reflection and perhaps e-portfolios into your own teaching, either on a large scale or on a very, very small scale. So to start out, I wanna flesh out the concept of, of reflection a little bit uh, as a possible opening of the door. Um, you'll notice that as I run through this Prezi presentation, there are images, and the images do have a correlation to the text that is on the screen. So you know, I may mention it and you may chuckle. So we learned to ride a bicycle, and I want you to think about when you first learned to ride a bicycle, because this is important. When we first learned to ride, we had somebody who showed us how. They gave us the concepts. And then we got on the bike, and we fell, all right, we had trouble steering, we had trouble getting our balance, but the important part of that process was that we learned on our own. We learned through our experiences how to ride the bike. Sure, we had the instruction and the guidance, but the experience was the part that really got us going. So we learned how to balance our weight on that bike. We learned how to run in a straight line with the bike. We learned how to turn corners. Now, one of my uh, current favorite people to read up on is Carl Rogers, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Carl Rogers or Rogerian therapy, um, but Carl Rogers um, was active in the early 1900s, uh, I believe up into the 70s or 80s, and his theories support the idea of actualization tendency, and that is the built-in motivation present in every single life form to develop to its full potential and to get to its real self. He founded a whole branch of, of counseling and therapy that bases a lot of their work, therapists' work, on the actualization tendency. Rogers stated that nature has provided all of us with organismic valuing, which is the ability to discern for ourselves what we like and what we do not like. All right? He also posited some ideas about positive self-regard, all right? We value others reflecting back to us in a positive manner. That helps us to get to what we call our real selves, all right? And of course, we have Stuart Smiley from, from Saturday Night Live that often helped us with those affirmation statements. Now, there are certain conditions of worth as well, and the problem with gaining our real selves or ideas of our real selves is that society imposes ideas of who we should be. Media does this all the time, television does this all the time, the internet does it all the time as well. We have to try to combat what society wants because society wants to give us this conception of an ideal self of who we should be, but Rogers 
posited that we need to think about our real self, that that ideal self is just a distraction. But often, we bend ourselves into the shape of what society wants for us. And rightly so, because we don't want to anger society in any way. Now, now all of this comes to an idea that, again, Rogers posited in terms of incongruity. And incongruity is the gap between our real selves and the ideal selves. The larger the gap between the two, the more we start becoming maybe a little neurotic. So think of how we're, think of that push me, pull me, okay, from Dr. Doolittle, how we're constantly being pulled apart by who we want to be and who society and others tell us we should be. So incongruity equals that. We don't want incongruity in our lives, right? And as I said, the more incongruity or gap we have between real self and ideal self, the more we feel stressed, anxious, and neurotic all the time. So, and this is something that happens between society and ourselves. So what does this mean? All of that I set you up with right now is kind of setting the framework, and I'm, I'm encouraging you to think as a Rogerian therapist for a minute. As educators, we should strive more to give back organismic valuing to our students, to our learners. So often, learners feel that they're just being given data, 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 and they have to spit that back to an instructor in order to get a good grade or to prove that they understand a concept. Um, what I'm positing to you and what I'm encouraging and hopefully inspiring everybody to do is to think about using reflection and the power of e-portfolios to help students get back that organism and value. Rogers also said that a healthy person is a fully functioning person, and that person usually has about five qualities, and we're going to start sounding a little bit like Maslow's hierarchy here as I read these off to you. The qualities are openness to experience, existential living, organismic trusting, trusting in your own valuing system of that, experiential freedom, and creativity. All right, so all of these, Rogers posited, make that healthy, fully functioning person. So, in terms of reflection, this is the main basis of all Rogerian therapy. Everybody uses reflection in Rogerian therapy. So, a uh, person sits on the couch, they talk to their counselor, the counselor usually reflects back to them what that person said. It's a form of active listening, if you've heard of that practice before, of active listening. It can get a little parroting, where Maybe the counselor is going to be parroting back exactly what the person said, but that mirror that is held up, that reflection that's held up to the person who needs the counseling, or as I'm positing here, the learner, is so important because sometimes when you hear something exactly back to you coming in, you're going to look at it from a different way, and you're definitely going to be learning because you're going to compare how you said it here and where you ended up over here. Um, I'll insert a, a quote from uh, Douglas Adams, and uh, Douglas Adams, the great British sci-fi writer, I love this quote. If someone thinks they're a hedgehog, presumably you just give them a mirror and a few pictures of hedgehogs and tell them to sort it out for themselves. Okay. <laughs> now, here's a little affirmation in action, and I, want, I love this clip, so I'm going to show it to you. You know, that idea of, of this small, cute child looking in the mirror and saying these affirmations <laughs> and asserting how that day is going to be makes a difference in that child's day. And that's a form of reflection. So, as I said, let's substitute that word client with learner. 
What if we use similar Rosarian techniques in our learning and teaching? And I say learning and teaching because of Eric Mazur. I'm not sure how many of you know of Professor Mazur, Dr. Mazur, but I heard him speak at Cornell recently, and he puts learning before the uh, teaching, which I agree with, because learning always comes first. It should be foremost in our heads. So can we give this or organismic valuing back to our learners and our students? And we can. We have to align ourselves to these concepts of reflection and e-portfolios. And as Rogers used to say, he wanted his therapists to have congruence, which is honesty or genuineness with their clients. They should have empathy with their clients and they should have respect for their clients. And, and I feel we need to do the same with our students as well. It's very important. How can we do this? There are many e-portfolio systems that are out there. There are simple ways that you can instill reflection into your everyday teaching in very small ways. So there are systems that are out there called Chalk and Wire, which is a Canadian company who, who deals with e-portfolio systems. Sakai OSP, OSP stands for Open Source Portfolio, is another one. Interfolio, Carbon Made, Adobe Acrobat Pro, Blogs, Pebblepad, Wikis. There's all kinds of tools that you can adopt to help you with the ideas of reflection and e-portfolios over time for showcasing evidence of student learning. Um, there are also simple ways that you can, you can bring in reflection. For example, um, mainly right now what I've been teaching is academic writing, and when my students hand back their papers to me, I mark them up, I give some marginalian comments, I give summation comments at the end, I do not put a grade on the essay. I hand it back to the students. They have to reflect back to me my comments to them and what they're going to do to make a change in their papers and their concepts. What are they going to do to make the paper even better? When I see that they have grasped everything that I have said through that little reflective process, then I assign a grade to the work. And it makes a huge difference because just that parroting back of my comments, the students are getting it through their head. I was successful here. I needed to work on my grammar in these areas. And what happens paper to paper? They make less and less of those same mistakes. So a simple manner of instilling reflection like that is, is very valuable. So portfolios themselves can be developmental. We can see certain work over time and progress over time. Portfolios can also be reflective, mainly for the learner to reflect on how they're growing, what they're learning. And then portfolios can also be representational. You can showcase. So think of uh, your traditional manner of having a portfolio. Say you're an art student, you have that portfolio and you take it to a job and you show your work. Right? That's what representation means. We can define it, a knee portfolio that is, as a purposeful collection of information and digital artifacts that demonstrates development or evidences learning outcomes, skills, or competencies. Right? So you're collecting student work. Um, I know Rhode Island School District, for example, uh, uses Sakai for the whole state, for their whole public school system. And they have uh, a certain standards of learning outcomes that students need to uh, meet before they graduate high school. And what all those students do is they submit evidence of their work to these various learning outcomes. And they choose, the student says, I feel that this piece of work that I did best meets this goal. They decide for themselves, and they submit it into a certain matrix in Sakai that then evaluators come in and look at it and say, yes, it does meet the learning outcomes of this particular standard, go ahead, or no, you need to work on this some more. So we're seeing this, I'm seeing this uh, in high schools starting to come up. So e-portfolios are something that we as educators in higher ed need to start thinking about. So at Cornell, uh, we ran a e-portfolio pilot, pilot for a few years. We started out using Sakai open source portfolio, and then we, we ended up with Chalk and Wire, a Canadian company. Uh, this was co-sponsored by our Center for Teaching Excellence and Claire Vandenblank's team and faculty support services. And we studied those two products, and more importantly, the question of, is it feasible at Cornell University to support a centralized e-portfolio system? What we found 
was that there were no clear consistencies between what faculty wanted to measure through the ePortfolio system or any ePortfolio system. We also found that ePortfolios and reflect, reflection-based learning were largely undefined concepts, not unknown, but undefined. So in the end, we did not settle on one ePortfolio system. We had gathered enough data to realize that there are too many different varying needs. So what we tend to do now is we do as needed consultations and we recommend various pro project products to those faculty members. So some may use a blog, uh, some may use the site CarbonMade to display artwork. Chalk and Wire is chalkandwire.com if you're interested, and as they describe themselves, they're a suite of tools and services that give educators the power to build systems and processes that house authentic learner work samples and assessment-related data sets. The little screenshot that you're seeing on the side is an example of one of Chalk and Wire's ePortfolios. Um, in Chalk and Wire, what I loved about Chalk and Wire is that the, the users build their ePortfolios with their portfolio. There's no back-end system that they're submitting data here and there. Every action that the person you, um, takes action on in their portfolio builds their portfolio. So they're always looking at their portfolio, which is great. Sakai Open Source Portfolio. Again, they describe themselves that uh, they can enhance the learning process through synthesis and reflection, provide a showcase for accomplishments to support assessments. So you're going to hear some themes here. What you're seeing up on the screenshot here is a, a example of one of Sakai's matrices. And what users do is, is they submit their evidence of their work in these various matrices that the faculty member department um, college has set up for them. It's a separate process to actually construct and build the portfolio. So most of the work is done in the matrix with a lot of reflection, with a lot of assessment going back and forth between uh, teacher and learner. And then at some point they can showcase it and build their portfolio as a website. So it's two separate processes. Interfolio, should you be interested? Uh, inter Interfolio is wonderful for portfolios, but it's more professionally bent. So if you're interested in getting out into the job market or you have students who are building resumes and CVs and putting them up online, Interfolio is a wonderful choice for that because it's a very, very professionally uh, <coughs> piece of software for portfolios. So it's not necessarily for more of those kind of developmental type of portfolios, but great for showcasing. Some tips, some lessons learned. If you're going to implement a portfolio, define what portfolio is. And I can't get out of my academic writing hat of how important definition is. We have to define what it means. If you're wanting your department to do it, if you want to do it individually, if you're going to do it in a series of classes, sit down with your folks and determine what do you mean when you mean portfolio. Also, begin with small steps if you're afraid of starting out large. Right? Try reflection out with one or two assignments and see how your students act with it. See how you like it, how you enjoy it. Provide students with examples of reflection. Provide them with an example of what a portfolio would look like or how you would want a portfolio to look. It's very important to model those so that students know what you're talking about because if you cannot clearly define and sell e-portfolios or portfolios to the students, they're not going to do it and it's not going to be as engaging for them or transformative. Also, have learners self-assess their, their skills pre-semester and post-semester and discuss the changes between the results. That's just an idea that you could use. We have a faculty member in landscape architecture at Cornell who has a very lengthy survey, a, a pre-skill self-assessment that she gives to her students at the beginning of the semester. They assess their skills in different areas and their knowledge in different areas. And they can also designate whether or not they want a certain area to be a goal for the course that they have. The faculty member then, at the beginning of the semester, compiles all that data. She can see where her students are strong, where they have weaknesses, where they need to develop, and what their goals are. And she can arrange her curriculum accordingly to those students. She do, uses pretty much the same survey at the end of the semester and talks with the students, here are your results at the beginning, here are your results at the end, what do you think happened in between? And that little process right there of reflection is very valuable to that faculty member and her department. So there are some links uh, that I do include in this presentation, and I'll pop up the, the URL to the presentation afterwards in my email address. You can email me if you want. Um, Dr. Stephen Brookfield's work on reflection is absolutely crucial and absolutely wonderful. He may, I can't promise this, but he may be coming to Cornell as well sometime in May, so keep a lookout. Um, 
also, the Joint Information Systems Committee in the UK has a wonderful website that gives you overviews of what ePortfolios are all about because they did a study in recent years about it and compiled lots of information. And then we have Chalk and Wire, Interfolio, and Sakai OSP, which are just a few of the projects that you, uh, products that you can use for ePortfolios. So, that's my presentation. Let me pop up my email address, emh89. If you don't want to write down the Prezi link that you have there, just send me an email and I will send you a link to it. I'll let you ask some questions because we do have a few minutes before our next presenter is going to start. Do you have any questions for me? The tonic of reflection, important. Scott. Yeah. It, um, the question was, how long do, do the different vendors keep the uh, artifacts within the system? Uh, it depends upon the vendor themselves. I know Chalk and Wire, um, they allow students to have access to their portfolios after they graduate and are, say, out of Cornell and they're out of the login for a certain amount of years, and then they can also purchase a separate license for themselves, a personal one, where they can keep working on it and have access. And most of the vendors work similarly. Um, not sure about Sakai. Do you know, Marilyn, how Sakai works with that? It may be up to the individual institution. Really. Well, I think we're adopting Sakai here, you know. Right. Um, and right now, open source portfolio is a part of our initial release. And if there's a demand for it, it it's in the realm of possibilities. And then mm -hmm. we actually have a vendor, Longsite, who is hosting it. And the license is free, so probably we'd have to discuss policies on how long we would it would be up to us, basically, how long we want to keep it forever. Right. And it's usually, from, from the vendors that I've worked with, it's, it's usually a conversation that starts off um, between the institution and the vendor themselves. And they usually, they usually will cater um, as best possible to get you. Other questions? All right. We're going to move on to our next presenter. Well, we probably... Thank you, Eric. Yeah?